So welcome everyone, whether you're tuning in from Shipley, from Airedale, from Bradford or even beyond, it's great to have you with us online this morning. We are City Valley Church. Uh, we normally meet in two locations in City Valley Shipley and City Valley Airedale, but we've also got a huge heart to reach other locations such as Bradford City Centre. Our vision is to be a church that is loving Jesus, growing together and reaching Yorkshire and the nations. If you're new tuning in and you'd like to receive our weekly news email or our online activities for children and youth, then you can contact us through our church website. So welcome everyone, enjoy this time together and let's be encouraged as we celebrate Jesus together. Morning everyone, <clears throat> good to see you all again. Uh, welcome to Sunday Worship again and uh, with Beth and, and, and I. Great to see you all um, and be with you all. And I uh, just wanted to share, uh, I guess, you know, I think we just passed 100 days in lockdown. If, uh, if no one knew that, then uh, you, woo. <laughs> um, and I've just realised I've started to get a little bit down. Um, and I think, you know, it's just like normal life as well as lockdown, sort of all the things that you know, little things that happen along the way and it can get you down. And, um, you know, I was just thinking about this and, uh, and the, I, 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 I think I've very rarely in my life since I was very little missed a Sunday morning day of worship, um, with the, with the congregation. Um, and that's probably the same. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, we just, I feel it like I just miss worshiping with you guys and just being with you guys and having a joke and, and, uh, yeah, so I think it has gotten me down a bit, and I was just thinking on this uh, this beautiful prayer in Ephesians that Paul that Paul writes, um, and I won't read all of it, but I'll read from Ephesians one seventeen to eighteen. He says, "I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know Him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order." that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And I just, that word hope just really sparked, you know, the sense in me that I need to stop looking down. I need to look up and remind myself to look up and that there is hope. Um, and that even though I don't feel, you know, sometimes like it is, you know, the more you look into um, into the heart and the eyes of the Saviour, um, he just builds more and more hope. So that's our prayer, my prayer for you guys uh, this morning, is that as we worship together, um, if you're feeling a bit like I'm feeling, then maybe you'll just, just know his hope um, into the calling that you have received in him.
bless you all, <clears throat> miss you all, love you all. Um, hopefully see some of you soon. Um, and uh, yeah, just bless you all. Bye. 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 <laughs> Well, I expect you've heard the breaking news from the government that as of the 4th of July, there are all sorts of things that we uh, are going to be able to do, new things that we can do. And one of the headlines was that churches can now reopen their doors. Well, as we shared at our Zoom Family Infonauts, we knew that this would come with a whole long list of uh, understandable restrictions. Uh, which our trustees are continuing to look at. And we're also chatting to other church leaders. Uh, but what we're saying is that at the moment, we won't be resuming our Sunday gatherings, uh, but we'll keep you updated uh, as things change. But there are some exciting things that we can do uh, from the 4th of July. So let's be clear. There's all sorts of understandable confusion out there because obviously there's different guidelines for different uh, different ones of the home nations. Um, but this is for England, reading from uh, the government website. So uh, you can have a look at it on your computers, but this is uh, reading from their website. Uh, in England, you can meet people you do not live with, okay? And there's different, uh, different scenarios. One of the scenarios you can continue to meet in any outdoor space in a group of up to six people from different households. And then this new, this new bit that's like mega exciting, um, from the 4th of July, you could also meet in groups of two households in any location. So public or private, indoors or outdoors. And importantly, this does not need to be the same household each time. So you can see someone in the morning in their house uh, and then go and see someone in the afternoon, uh, different out, or have people come and see you. Uh, obviously, social distancing needs to be observed. So this is really exciting because we can now have fellowship with each other in person, and we're not at the mercy of the Yorkshire weather. So from this Sunday, let's let me encourage you uh, to be thinking. You know, who can who can I be meeting up with? You know, for instance, you can arrange to have breakfast on Sunday and then watch the online service together with someone, you know, with a household. Um, or um, you, could have, you could have someone round, uh, watch the online service and then have an early lunch together. Um, or you can have a household round in the week, uh, other times. Um, so don't forget, obviously, when the weather's warm enough, you can meet uh, up to six people outside or two households outside. Uh, so this is exciting because we can get to share life with each other in the same room. So I really encourage you to be uh, taking initiative. Uh, this is a big step forward. Um, so let's, let's really kind of seize with both hands uh, this opportunity. Well, one of the promises over us is, as a church is that we'll be a place of safety that will bring healing for the brokenhearted. And we really just don't know the scale of uh, what we're going to find when we come out of lockdown. And so we, we just want to be ready to um, pour out God's love to those in our community that, that need it. And, and so we really just want to invite you to pray about um what Jesus is asking you to uh, give into a hope fund that we talked about at our family info nights. Um, so we imagine that this hope fund will be used for supporting individuals in and outside of the church, getting behind existing community initiatives in Shipley, Airedale and Bradford, and also um, setting up new initiatives uh, ourselves or getting behind other new initiatives being set up. Um, so it's understandable that uh, we could well need some more job clubs um, to provide support for um, bereavement courses or parenting or, or marriages. And so we just want to we just want to have a pot of money that is uh, we can quickly draw to to help uh, respond for these things. Um, but also 
uh, we want to give half of the HOPE Fund to the Christ Central COVID-19 Fund. And um, you heard Jeremy talk about this. Um, so this, uh, this, this is for uh, really support of our friends in the churches in Africa, where uh, the main um, fallout for, from COVID-19 is the economic fallout, because there's many, many in the churches there that um, really have no way of making money because of the restrictions. And so uh, hunger um, is, a, is a huge issue. So, um, so not only is it uh, getting food um, to the churches and, and the, the communities that the churches help, but also seed to be able to plant for the coming harvest. And it is just a real privilege that actually God would uh, use us or that we can be part of uh, the gift to uh, these churches in Africa to help them at this time. So, so let's be praying. And uh, there's more information on the website about this. Well, good morning, City Valley Church. I'm looking forward to continuing our series on feasting on the sounds and parables this morning. This Sunday and next Sunday, we're going to be looking at the next parable in our current series, the parable of the lost son. And today we're going to be focusing on the heart of the father. And next week, we're going to focus on the hearts of the sons. This parable in Luke 15 is part of three stories, all intended to be read together. They're all about things that are lost and then found. First a sheep, then a coin, and here it's a son who is lost. Or more accurately, two sons that are lost. But we're going to come on to that next week. Now, we haven't got time to unpack all three of these stories this morning, but I encourage you to do so in your own time. This is one of those stories you hear retold time and time again. It gets retold in numerous different ways. It's a story that's inspired literature and art over the centuries and often gets referred to as the gospel within the gospels. Now, how I've approached and understood this parable has changed over the years. For a long time, I thought this was simply about a foolish son who made a bunch of bad decisions and discovers the consequences of his actions. Uh, and eventually he seeks out forgiveness. And at times in my life, I've, I've really identified <laughs> with this younger son. And it wasn't until later in life that during a talk at university, my eyes were opened to the older brother in this parable. But again, I thought, oh yeah, now I get it. Jesus, you're highlighting that I need to identify with this, this jealous, works-based and self-righteous older brother. I get it. However, each time I've read and approached this parable, I keep focusing on the actions of the sons, comparing and relating their actions with my own and making this parable all about me, my actions that lead to me finding my forgiveness. I keep missing what, what I believe is Jesus' main point for telling this parable. This is all about the heart of the Father. Jesus is wanting to redefine our understanding of how our Heavenly Father loves us. His heart is a heart of grace. It's important to, we understand some of the context we find this parable in. So to do that, we're going we're gonna to come back uh, to the very start of Luke 15, where it says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, that is Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told this parable. And through these next three stories that follow, Jesus is radically redefining how the sinners, tax collectors and Pharisees understand and perceive who a father is and how a father should act. And this is key. The sinners and tax collectors would have been keenly seeing how the younger son gets treated by the father, whilst the Pharisees would have been expecting and, and possibly even looking forward to seeing how the father punishes the younger son. But here, Jesus blows their preconceptions out of the water and redefines how the father loves his children. And my question to you this morning is, how do you see God? How do you view your heavenly father? How do you expect he acts towards you as his son or daughter. Now, a couple of weeks ago, it was Father's Day, and I found myself stood in front of the card section in Asda. For me, that's kind of known as the Isle of Indecision. Uh, now, by looking at these cards 
available. You'd be forgiven for thinking a father is someone who likes golf, boats, fishing, drinking beer, who falls asleep a lot, a personal taxi driver, and someone who obsesses about turning all the lights off around the house. But it's really important for us to address and ask ourselves, what shapes my understanding of what a father is like? And I'm aware these will, these will both be negative and positive at times. You know, I've heard stories, many stories over the years of those amongst us who have experienced wonderful, loving and caring fathers, others who haven't known their father, and some for whom the, the title father means someone who is absent, harmful, even abusive, you know, an unimaginable, painful reality to live with. And all of our experiences of fathers will shape how we receive this parable and the truth within it. Now, I'm not wanting to, to gloss over this or, or belittle all of our varied experiences of fathers. However, this morning, I want to help us come back to the starting place. How does Jesus define and describe who our heavenly father is? And Louis Giglio sums it up like this. God is not a reflection of that, but a perfection of that. Now, our challenge with this parable is that we know the ending, you know, you know, we know forgiveness, reconciliation and a big old party is waiting for the sun at the end of this story. However, I want to encourage you to try and imagine this morning that, that you don't know how this parable will end and try and imagine what the father would have been feeling and thinking as this story unfolds. So let's, let's read it. Let's turn to Luke 15 verses 11 to 24. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now, obviously, this is not where the story ends, but rest assured, we're going to pick up the rest of the story next week. So here we have the youngest son asking his father to give him the, the deeds to a third of all he owns and then to grant him permission to sell that land. The son then takes the money and walks away. You know, this isn't just asking for some spending money. This is a complete relational breakdown. The son disowning his family, his ancestral heritage, family wealth throughout generations sold just like that. Let's not overlook or underestimate the pain of this for the father. The son is basically wishing him dead. He's saying, I can't wait for you to die. I want what you can give me, but I do not want you. You know, this would have been the talk of the whole village. Everyone would have known what shame the son had brought upon his father's name and household. You know, the father would have felt the full weight of this dishonour. Not managing his household well in the eyes of others, losing face, people questioning his parenting, his authority, his status. Ouch. In Middle Eastern cultures, fathers would have been expected to punish uh, and to beat a son severely for such a request and to drive him off the property. However, this is not how this father responds. Because of his grace and only by his grace, he gives the son the freedom and choice to reject him. His grace allows the son to choose to walk away and come to the end of himself. Why? Well, ultimately, 
so that he would realise that home is where he belongs. and Nothing compares to the love of the father. So the younger son, he, he heads for fun and adventure. He spends all the money on extravagant living until he has nothing left. A famine hits the land. He ends up having no other option other than to pick up work on a pig farm, feeding and eating with the pigs. This is ultimate shame for a Jewish boy and his family. So the son comes up with a plan to return home. And we read in verses 18 and 19, And the son is preparing and refining a speech he's going to deliver to his dad. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That seems like a pretty good speech. And and for a long time in the West, we've concluded that this is the point. It's here where the son repents whilst he's still in the far country. However, the son's speech doesn't end there. He goes on. Make me like one of your hired men. Uh, Have you noticed? He is still looking out for himself above all. You know, the son is still trying to work out how he can solve the problem. The son is working out what he can say, how he can soften the father up so that he might offer him work, so that he can earn his way back. The son is still trying to get what he wants out of the father. At this point, the son just has not realised what the problem is. You know, the issue wasn't what happened in the far country. The real problem is what happened before he left. The son is there thinking it's all about the money that he's lost. However, the real issue is a broken relationship, rejected love, that the son has broken the father's heart. And did you notice how the son's speech changed when he arrived back home? In verse 21, it says this, The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You know, the son is no longer focusing on how am I going to solve the problem? But here we find him face to face with his father, giving up any hope that he might be able to solve the problem by himself. He surrenders the reality that he can't make things right. Now, surely this is the point of repentance. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Full stop, period. Here we see his eyes are opened. You know, it's not the agony of the lost money. It's the agony of rejected love and a broken relationship. And all the son can do is accept the grace and love that is offered to him. The son accepts his need to be found. Have you ever thought why the son revises his speech? Well, it's because he encounters the heart of his father. The story reveals so many wonderful aspects of fatherly love. You know, the father's love that is unconditional, everlasting, unrelenting, protective, merciful, caring, faithful, gentle, patient. The list goes on. But this morning, I just want to want to highlight two aspects of the father's heart that we see in this story. Firstly, the heart, the father's heart shows that it is a a love that is sacrificial. It's costly. And secondly, this love is something that restores. Now, to understand how sacrificial the father's love is, we need to, again, understand more of the culture that this story is set in. In Middle Eastern Jewish culture, There was something called a kazasa ceremony, the cutting off ceremony. This would have taken place when someone married an immoral woman, or as it is in this case, when someone loses the family inheritance to the Gentiles. And we know that because we, we read that the son ended up working on a pig farm. So the son would have been expecting a kazasa ceremony on his return. And during this ceremony, the villagers, uh, they would have filled up earthenware pot and, and kind of put burnt corns and nuts inside, dragged the person to the central square, and they would have smashed the pot on the ground in front of the whole village. And this would have been a clear sign that this person has been cut off from their village, cut off from his family. And as a result, no one would have hired them. No one would be obliged to feed them or care for them. And you can almost imagine the, the Pharisees expecting this is, this is going to be the next part of Jesus' story, looking forward to how, how severely the son will be punished and how he'll be forced to pay for his wrongdoing. However, as the son returns home, what happens first? Does he get to give his prepared speech? Does the father take the opportunity to say, son, I told you so? No, not this father. We read that the father runs and embraces his son. He kisses him unclean and dirty as he is, with the sight and stench of his shame, of his actions painfully on show for all to see. At this point, the father has no idea why their son is coming home. He doesn't know what he's going to say. For all he knows, he could be coming home to ask for more money. 
For what we see is that the costly offer of love comes first. Before anything else, the Father shows compassion and sacrificial love. We see that the Father takes on the form of a suffering servant in public humiliation. He leaves his house, his dignity, his honour, and he runs after his son. You know, the whole village would have been extremely hostile towards the son, out to get him, probably wanting to stone him, making an example of him. So when we read that the father runs, yes, it's out of compassion, but also he wants to reach the son before the rest of the village can get to him. He's literally running to save him. If the, if the village had started to stone the son, they would have hit the father who was embracing him. This is the father's love for us, his sacrificial, costly love. And we read that the father's love is also a love that restores. You know, the son acknowledges to the father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. In verse 22, the father responds. He says to his servants, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Here we see the restorative love of the father, the best robe, the robe of sonship, not slavery, the robe of full, lavish, enthusiastic, unrestrained restoration to the family. The ring restored the son's position as an heir. You know, once again, he has power to sign documents to move the family's wealth around. And the father wraps his robe around him, takes on his son's dishonour to restore honour, becomes unclean on his behalf. His robe is covering all evidence of the son's filth sin and shame. He's covered and hidden in the father's robe. You know, when the village sees the son wearing his father's robe, sees the ring on his finger and the sandals on his feet, they will now, for the sake of the father, have to once again accept the son. The father is clothing the son in his righteousness. Does this remind you of anything? It reminded me of a couple of verses. Firstly, Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And the same is true for us this morning. The Father chooses to clothe us in Jesus' righteousness. You and I, hidden in Christ. No matter what we've done or what we've not done, this morning you are clothed in a, in a robe of righteousness. That's really interesting, isn't it? That the Son just simply doesn't get it until he sees the Father getting hurt for him. He doesn't get it until he comes face to face with his Father, until he sees his Father's demonstration of costly, sacrificial love. It's the Father's costly love that needs to always be our starting place. And this is such a wonderful picture of the cross, the broken heart of God becoming visible for us, a window into the Father's heart so that we too can see how costly his love is for us, how broken his heart is for us. 1 John 4.10 says this, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And I love how Timothy Keller puts it. Jesus has given us a breathtaking picture of the nature of God's love for us. Despite all the pain we have inflicted upon our Father through our willful rebellion, our Father stands ready and willing to take us into his arms again and accept us as his children. He is calling us home again to enjoy his fellowship, to be part of his family, to worship him as King and Lord. He proved his love through the sacrifice as his only son. We prove our love by returning to his arms and obeying his commands. Jesus on the cross, the suffering servant in public humiliation for us, bearing all of our sin and dishonour, becoming unclean on our behalf, the ultimate expression of the Father's heart for us. Why? So that we can come home. So that we can once again be called sons and daughters of God, forgiven, restored and loved unconditionally. And we need to allow ourselves to keep being melted and moved by the cost of our Father to bring us home. This cost of our salvation and restoration into his family. Is this how you view your Heavenly Father today? Do you know you are loved in this way? Well, in a few minutes, we're going to break bread over Zoom. 
And we're going to spend time just thanking Jesus for this sacrificial and restorative love that he poured out for us on the cross. We're going to take time just to humble ourselves. Once again, accept that we can't earn our way back. Repent and reject all the times that we, we have tried to earn his love or we've rejected his love. And once again, ask Jesus to forgive us, restore us, that we might receive once again his robe of righteousness, his love and his grace for us.